My name is Vint Cerf, and I am Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist at Google uh, since 2005. Some people know me as one of the co-inventors of the Internet. It's amazing what, what happened in the last five decades, and so not only the technology uh, is becoming more complex and uh, more unexpected uh, in a way, so as you have a lot of experience uh, in the last years or even decades, um, how do you, do you perceive this, this change? So many people say like, what oh, the society um, is, has an, an increased dynamic, uh, it's, it's increased complexity. How do organizations and, and people deal with this new situation for some? So uh, technology invariably uh, winds up uh, with emerging properties that we didn't predict. And uh, there's another phenomenon called tipping point phenomena. Tipping point phenomena are, are important. And it's those sorts of recognitions, understanding those phenomena, that help you anticipate what might happen. Even though you won't know in detail what will happen, you need to know that tipping point phenomena are real. Feedback loops are real. And we see this in uh, social networking, for example. Uh, if you look at uh, YouTube, one of the metrics of success in a YouTube video is how many people watched it. Uh, one of the metrics of success in the um, uh, Twitter space is how many people are following you. Uh, and you can you see other kinds of similar kinds of um, uh, phenomena like that. What's important about this is knowing those phenomena and understanding their dynamics so you could recognize them however they show up even if you don't know in detail when and how they're going to appear. So uh, my view of preparation for unexpected phenomena is that you design systems that are not so rigid that they can't cope with a sudden change in uh, environment, a sudden shift in uh, consumer interest, a sudden change in the cost of something. Example. Uh, in the case of uh, newspapers, for many years, paper was the cheapest way of getting a lot of information out on a regular basis. And so, and everybody wanted to know what was new. And because people wanted to read what was new, the newspapers said, well, then they might also want to know what's available, in other words, advertising. Those two uh, were uh, married together in a very powerful combination, and it made a tremendous business. So newspapers and advertising, classified ads and so on, built enormous empires. Then what happens? Technology comes along and it turns out there's another way of getting people's attention uh, for products that are for sale or services that are available. So suddenly Craigslist comes along and undermines the classified ad business. Uh, people shift away from reading newspapers on a 24-hour cycle and watching television news or uh, listening to the radio, or eventually going online and looking at things in the World Wide Web. And so this undermines the business model. This happens in other uh, dimensions as well. And so there's an old saying, if someone is going to eat your lunch, it might as well be you, which means that you may have to cannibalize your own products and services before a competitor does in order to avoid that particular problem by finding something uh, to uh, substitute for it. So in the internet design, we were very careful not to over-specify how the system worked. And if you look at the internet protocol spec, for example, it says nothing about how you route traffic through the network. It says nothing. It assumes that there is a way to do that. And of course, we uh, explored a wide range of different ways to do that. Uh, similarly, the uh, specification doesn't say anything about how packets are moved through the network, not the routing, but the actual carriage. And that allowed us to build systems that had radio-based or satellite-based or fiber-based or other transport-based systems because we didn't care what it was. We only cared that you could move bits from one place to another. We also said that the packets of the system had no knowledge of what information they were carrying. And that was very deliberate. The idea was that the computers at the edges of the network would interpret the bits that the packets delivered. That meant that if you wanted to add a new application to the network, the network didn't change. 
because it didn't know what the applications were. So we didn't want to specialize the underlying packet transport system to a particular application so that we uh, didn't accidentally rule out some application later. Example, in the early days of the ARPANET and subsequent internet, the backbone traffic was running at 50 kilobits a second and later went up to one and a half megabits in the early NSF net. Uh, we could not carry very much voice and video on a 50 kilobit channel, but we tried anyway. And we did that because we knew eventually that the capacities would go up. We didn't know when, we didn't know how, but, the, but it was a good bet. And so now, of course, the backbone speeds are 100 gigabits a second or 400 gigabits a second, and people are streaming video all the time. We're doing video conferencing, and Google just recently announced a game-playing system called Stadia, which is giving 20 millisecond round-trip times you know, for Twitch games. Uh, so once again, the whole idea here is to not make uh, assumptions about the system design that foreclose a future that might be feasible. And that's how you deal with unexpected results because you design systems that are prepared for this kind of shift in technology or change in cost. In jazz music, people say they have a minimal structure, so they just know some basic things. They have all to agree on that. But what will emerge, uh, it is free um, due to their creative performance. And it, it seems to me an analogy from technology and music and perhaps even organizations to, to have a, a minimal structure uh, to create a space in which a lot of freedom is possible. Do you see a, a similar analogy here? I suppose you could call the people who design and build protocols for the internet as, uh, as having the moral equivalent of a, uh, a jazz jam where you have basic musical instruments and somebody plays a little melody and then everybody jumps in and tries to figure out how to augment that either with nice harmony or maybe a complementary uh, melody. Uh, you, it's, it's not the world's best analogy, but there's a certain uh, element of truth to that. The one thing I would say, though, is that uh, whereas jazz tends to be very ad hoc, uh, the world that I live in is less so. Uh, you need to have fairly carefully crafted protocols, for example, in order to build an application. And so it's, the applications may vary dramatically, There's, so there, that might be very ad hoc, but the actual underlying thing that enables those applications have to have a certain amount of commonality and uniformity, otherwise it won't work network-wide if we're thinking about in internet terms. If you're thinking about a business, about which I know only a little, um, you still have this fundamental thing where the business has to survive by making enough money to cover its expenses. And that means you have to understand enough about the market for products and services to know whether or not the business is viable. And so the first question that, that should get asked is, please explain to me how you've segmented the market and how you make money. And if you can't answer those questions, you're probably not a good investment. So some people say um, it's, it's harder and harder to, to plan in advance because the future uh, is unknown um, and it, it changes so fast that people have to think on their feet to be ad hoc or spontaneous or to improvise even. Um, do you also see that, that the society really gets more complex and faster or is it just like um, a period of time of five or ten years and then it's going slower again? Well, this raises an interesting question because if you didn't grow up with something, it, then that's called technology. If you grew up with it, it's just there. And so if you think about uh, people using telephones, not, not the mobiles, but the conventional telephone handset, uh, at the point where most homes had telephones, or at least in the societies I've lived in, Nobody sat you down and showed you how to use the telephone. You watched other people using the phone and you sort of understood it by, by simply um, watching. And what that implies, I think, is that you don't necessarily recognize that uh, you had to learn how to do these things because it happened over a period of time by watching other people using these systems. 
uh, what, when new technology shows up that you didn't grow up with, suddenly you're confronted with how do I use it and you actually need help. So people come to you and say, with your mobile phone or a laptop, and say, how do I do X? And we see a lot of that, by the way, on Google. When people come to the Google search engine or they go to YouTube and they say, how do I do X for some value of X? Uh, and so that's an explicit recognition that I need to learn something. And, and if you uh, are comfortable with the idea that, that new things will come along that you will encounter that you need to learn about, then you're already preparing yourself for unexpected events. Because when they finally show up and you know you need to learn something about it, you're comfortable with that notion. So what would be your recommendation uh, for, um, for people or organization who, who, who are not uh, in, in this phase of that they have the experience that things change and they prepare for that? What would you recommend them to be prepared for the unprepared if this is possible? Well, first of all, without any question at all, uh, in order to prepare for an uncertain future in which you may have a lifetime of work that exceeds 50 to 60 years, you have to recognize that technology is going to evolve during that six decade period. And so from the get-go, somebody needs to tell you, you are going to have to learn new things in the course of your career. And second, you're going to have to learn how to learn those new things. And you're going to have to learn to want to learn those new things. And that's hard, because some people don't like to learn something new because it's change, and it means you have to learn something new instead of doing what you used to do. That's why people hate it when you change the user interfaces on things, because they figured out the previous one, now they have to figure out a new one, and they don't like it unless there's some real clear benefit. Uh, so understanding that learning is very critical uh, for a career or just living uh, is sort of the first lesson that everybody needs to, uh, to assimilate. Uh, and then uh, taking advantage of the fact that there are tools around to help you learn new things easily and quickly and in a timely way is just as important. So I watch people trying to figure out how do I do something, for, you know, like edit a video or uh, get access to a Microsoft Word document or create a presentation. Uh, What's amazing to me is that there are so many people who've taken the trouble to make videos on YouTube to tell you how to do that, or you know, to cook a goose, or you know, to uh, repair your car, or configure your computer. Uh, it's astonishing, but when you have billions of people who are online and tools available, readily, uh, readily available to record videos, for example, and edit them right there on your laptop, then suddenly you discover people all, always willing to go to the trouble of sharing what they know. And that was the original motivation behind the World Wide Web's uh, rapid evolution. Once the capability was there to share what you knew, everybody decided that was easy and they wanted to do that. So we had bazillions of documents show up in the internet. Then we couldn't find anything until the search engines came along and helped us do that. So that's another example of a technology recognizing a problem and then being developed in order to solve it. So today, I think we still have people who are strongly motivated to share what they know, simply for the joy of knowing that what they knew is helpful to somebody else. So my last question would um, connect to the, to the first question, like the first answer that you gave. So there are tipping points. So like in the video recording system, there was a tipping point which system uh, will win, so to say. Do you see uh, any systems right now, like if you say like, oh, there, there could be a tipping point, this, this could be a change for the next years, perhaps? Um, there were several uh, very obvious tipping points that are not yet uh, visible, but they will get there. Uh, you're familiar, I'm sure, with this phrase, Internet of Things. There are many, many devices that could be programmable, and they're becoming more and more uh, attractive to be programmable so that you can uh, augment the device's capability just by sending new software, like Elon Musk does with Teslas. The implication of that is that you need standards in order to update the software and to make these devices work with each other. And the tipping point there may very well be a com what will these devices hold in common? What protocols will they use? How will they use authentication to make sure that an update is coming from a legitimate source and has integrity and hasn't been altered? 
we need to have an ecosystem that has enough commonality to confer interoperability among its various parts. And uh, the tipping point phenomenon depends a great deal on whether we do come to common agreement or whether we decide we're going to have our own proprietary designs that reject interaction and interoperation with anybody else's product. That would be a huge loss for the consumers. And so in a sense, those of us who are in this business have an enormous responsibility to try to achieve commonality and interoperability for the benefit of the consumers, even if it means that we don't necessarily get to uh, capture you know, some particular portion of the market.